Our next guests have extensive experience in global trade. Penny Pritzker, as I'm sure you know, was the Commerce Secretary under President Obama, who urged China to further open its markets and extend trade. Um, she's also, congratulations are in order to Penny, she just joined the Microsoft board. Uh, the other, Andrew Robb, is a former minister uh, for trade and investment from Australia. He's been on the cutting edge of negotiating trade deals with China, Korea, and Japan. And joining them is a leader in Chinese trade relations. Uh, and he's going to bring his expertise from the Chinese perspective. Uh, John Chow Chung, welcome all of you. Congratulations on Microsoft. Thank you, Nina. Thanks, Nina. Thanks for coming. Thank you. So I think as we sort of get our, uh, our translation set up here, um, let me start by setting up this panel because, you know, I, I think we have to step back for a minute when we think about trade and just think about a year ago, TPP was likely going to pass. I know Hillary Clinton <laughs> criticized it, uh, but my sense was that it probably would have, she would have nipped and tucked it and stuck it in the oven and it would have come out the other side. So, um, but we've had an extraordinary shift in the dynamics of trade policy. We now have a president who has declared that he doesn't want any more multilateral agreements, and in fact, only bilateral agreements because that gives uh, the United States more power. Um, so that raises the question, Penny, are multilateral trade deals dead? I don't think so. I really don't think so. If you think about the Belt and Road Initiative, you think about RCEP, you think about the TPP-11, I think there's a yearning for multilateralism and I don't agree with our current president's approach. I think TPP was an important uh, deal, but I also think it was an important arrangement that knit together 40% of the world's GDP and uh, focused around Asia. And Asia is a region where much of the 21st century history is going to be written. And it's, TPP was a way to shape trade in that region and in this region. And so it's important. And I think that the economic and strategic logic of that agreement still holds, uh, even though obviously this administration is not going to pursue that. But I'm an optimist. I, I'm encouraging the TPP-11 to proceed and hope the U.S. is not finished with it. And what does it say about, what, what is the impact on the power dynamics between the U.S. and China, the fact that we don't have TPP? Well, I, I think that uh, it, I think there's an impact because I know that China, when I was in serving as Secretary of Commerce, was very interested in thinking about what would it mean to ultimately join TPP. And there was a notion that this is something that had momentum within the region and therefore they, it, it was having influence on how we did trade, how the economic, what were the economic rules of the road. And without that, it leaves a void that allows for lowering of standards in the region, which is not to the benefit of anybody's people. So Andrew, like Penny, you were very much on the forefront of negotiating TPP, correct? Um, and you said something pretty extraordinary to me um, backstage. Um, you thought the US, or you said the US is a destabilizer in this region right now. Uh, this is my, I left politics last uh, a year ago, 15 months ago, um, not long after negotiating the TPP and the China Free Trade Agreement. Um, and since then, in the last 15 months, I've, this is my 24th visit to the region. So um, I am seeing uh, so many of the ASEAN countries and China and Japan and South Korea on a regular basis. Um, and my observation is the, the most destabilising influence in the region is the fact that uh, the United States pulled out of TPP. The forerunner to the TPP conclusion, uh, which the US concluded, obviously, and it's a great deal, and it would have done so much phenomenal improvements, I think, in trade. But the big thing was that the geopolitics. The United States had said for years 
This is a demonstration of our commitment to the region. This is a pivot to Asia. This is a, a demonstration not just about trade and investment, but it was a much broader. Um, it was read as a much broader commitment to the region. Now, there was no real sense that the US would follow through, or Trump would, and pull out. Um, I can tell you all the smaller countries in Asia feel that no, one's now, no one has got their back. I mean, they, they, they're all, they all have China as the biggest trading partner, as we do in Australia, and the US does. Um, but they like the balance, right? They like the balance of two big powerful groups, and especially the US with its 70 years of phenomenal uh, progress and support for the, for the world. China and India are re-emerging, China in particular, but India not far behind. Um, and the world is going to change this century, and the US better start getting used to it, because at the moment, every time I go to Washington for the last five years, there's been an obsession with containment of China. It's impossible, it's futile, and it's, in my view, um, uh, counterproductive. We need to find ways to share power in the years ahead and do so in a, in a peaceful and stable manner and, and not repeat history, or some of history, where that sort of power shifts um, associated with conflict. Mr. John, what, um, what is the, your perspective on the changing power dynamics between China and the US when it comes to global trade? In the past 10 years, uh, you've already seen such a change. The uh, emerging economies, uh, develop, economies are developing really quickly, especially uh, in the overall global GDP. The emerging economies uh, proportion exceeded that of the uh, developed country. That's the major, that was the, for the first time and uh, was a major change. And among the emerging countries, uh, China is a major uh, country as well. For example, uh, if we look at the statistics uh, in terms of the goods tr uh, transaction, for consecutively five years, uh, China has already become the largest one, except last year, uh, it was sec China was second to that of the United States. And this year, I believe uh, there will be around 12% of the uh, growth uh, with a total number of uh, uh, 4.2 trillion will uh, make China the largest uh, international trade uh, economy. So as the largest the developed and developing country, the uh, bilateral healthy economic development and trade relations uh, will not only impact the bilateral uh, relations, but also the overall economic uh, uh, structure of the world. We mentioned about the world trade and there are bilateral mechanisms, including WTO. We hope uh, we could uh, establish uh, uh, cooperation with the United States, uh, a more extensive uh, cooperation under the bilateral framework, for example, environment or electronics. Uh, what we, uh, that's what we did uh, under that framework. In terms of a tre regional cooperation mechanism, even though TPP decided to uh, uh, to retreat out of this uh, TPP arrangement. But within the APEC area, I believe there are still some uh, uh, possibility for us to uh, continue this uh, mod, uh, regional bilateral mechanism. So China, on one hand, uh, will continue to promote the bilateral um, mechanism. On the other hand, will continue to promote the RCEP, SAP, um, especially the FTA uh, upgraded version of uh, regional cooperation. We also uh, would not exclude the bilateral uh, cooperations. For example, we signed FTA with Australia this year. China-Australia trade grow quickly. In the first uh, three quarters of this month, uh, it went up by 40 percent year on year. So it was a huge uh, momentum of demand. So China also signed a great, uh, free FTA with um, uh, Korea, and recently, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, leaders um, have uh, shown that they would like to promote the uh, China, Japan, and Korea um, FTA. And we also signed uh, FTA with other countries not long before. So China and the United States uh, should uh, dedicate to uh, the uh, global trade uh, development, including bilateral, multilateral, and regional. Thank you.
Thank you. So, um, Penny, you know, in the United States, a lot of the focus, of course, is on Washington and what Washington is doing. But you've witnessed states and localities kind of doing their own acts on trade. Can you describe some of that? Yeah, let me step back and a little bit respond uh, to the comments. You know, the United States and China need each other. And, uh, you know, beyond just our trade and our business relations, we have a lot of issues that we're dealing with, like North Korea, where we have common interest. Uh, and it, it, there's challenges that the United States faces, and one of the reasons why it's so important that our two governments engage on trade issues and economic issues. You know, the United States needs greater market access in Asia, which is one of the reasons TPP was so important. Uh, you know, you've got forced technology transfer, in, uh, which is a deterrent here in China. You've got, you know, a state-driven uh, market that can create distorting effects where government plays an important role of helping to navigate that or to try and counterbalance that. And there are sectors of the economy here in China the U.S. doesn't have access to, and particularly with the declaration about strategic sectors. So. Um, and what, what is frustrating at the federal level is that our um, current administration is very focused on trade deficits as opposed to taking a broader scope and thinking about how do you level the playing field more broadly. The, while that's going on, our states, our, our governors and our mayors are not sitting still. They are working with their businesses to be present here in China and to welcoming Chinese businesses into their communities um, because it's good for our peoples. It's good for business, but it's also good for employment and job creation and economic opportunity. And I see it in my home city of Chicago, uh, all the efforts that Mayor Emanuel has made uh, to really grow relations with China. Uh, they signed two, in 2013, Chicago signed an agreement with eight cities in China that has led to enormous growth in the presence of Chinese businesses in our city. I see it in Virginia. Uh, governor McAuliffe, I think, has made over 60 trips in his four years as governor to around the world, uh, and especially here to China, working to attract businesses to the state of Virginia. And on and on. You see it in Colorado and other states. So. At, if it's not working at one level, there's efforts going on at other levels in our government. But we need all of it to be working because there's issues that, frankly, only the federal government can address. And Andrew, you, as a country that has a FTA with China, what's your reaction to Penny's uh, criticism about the Chinese, uh, the Chinese policies? Well. Uh, I thought Penny was largely um, uh, acknowledging the common sense and the level of activity that's occurring uh, at all levels, at other levels other than perhaps the federal. Now that's, um, that's very true in most countries, I think certainly true in Australia, that uh, they weren't waiting for the federal government, though a deal which, um, which gave us um, you know, lots of concessions on lots of areas that we're good at and that China need. Um, it all made sense and we're seeing the results with the, the trade and activity on goods and services. This is a great disappointment about um, the TPP because, um, like Penny said, there are issues with state-owned enterprises, etc. These are, for the first time ever, included in a trade We're agreement, addressed. That's right? Correct, yeah. And with really um, significant penalties and mm -hmm. commitments. You think about this, Vietnam signed up to the TPP. Vietnam, communist country, right? Um, latter day market economy, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, a very um, developing state. All, of the, all the things we all know about uh, Vietnam, yet they had a capacity to go from where they were to signing TPP, which is the most ambitious trade agreement that's ever been put in, 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 on, on the table in the world. And it was, just shows you, you know, how the rest of Asia is embracing liberalising of trade, how they're embracing um, trade and investment and liberalising their own economies. And yet, you know, the, 
the perception of the US is that it's going isolationist. And, and you ca the, th the problem is the, the broad implication of that, not at the local level where mayors and that are, you know, there's still a lot of contact which is really valuable so people get to know and trust one another and understand one another uh, and trade with one another and invest. But at the overall level, so many of these smaller countries, in the ASEAN in particular, um, they're not big enough to stand up to the US or to China, right? Um, and when one leaves the stage, and that's what the US has seemed to have done, is left the stage in Asia in a geopolitical sense. Right. And they feel their back is not covered. They feel very vulnerable just dealing with, um, you know, a, a China that's growing phenomenally and we all, we all benefit from that. But they just want to see some balance, you know. They're not looking to suppress anybody. They want, they want both countries to, to succeed because we all benefit from that. But at the moment, they feel that America's turned away from the region. Can I just ask you both very briefly, if, if there was a change in administrations in the next election, because nothing's static, things change, um, is the TPP something that could, you could still pick up and run with, or will have, are there things about it that too much will have changed? No, 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 it, it's, um, uh, that's the trouble. A lot of things have been frozen. I mean, it, it goes into areas, child labor and illegal fishing and environmental issues, you know, the things that were raised by Mr. Shung. These things are in the agreement with uh, really strong enforcement measures agreed by all 12, right? right. So it, um, it, it's, it's got all sorts of advantages. Now, um, I think we, we could, even after six years, if Trump got another, it would still be highly relevant. But uh, the trouble is, it, it, I think very much I'm a great supporter of the 11 doing it, um, but the US is 70% of TPP. So it's like a big omelette, and you take 70% of the omelette out. But, but the thing is, if TPP was approved by the 11 and introduced, it would put enormous pressure politically on the United States administration and, uh, you know, all sorts of things could but happen. You, you'd have, I mean, I, I've been around enough trade negotiators to know how painstaking and difficult and detailed and complex all these are. Would you have to start all over again? No, no, you, no, you, no, okay. no, no, no not with the, the 12. In my view, we, we went to the wire. I mean, the last few issues was three days without sleep. I mean, we were really... Yeah, I... I and, um, uh, and I don't see any reason to, um, you, if you undo any of it, you undo the lot of it. And um, it, it's, it'll be still highly relevant, even if it introduced any time over the next few years. Briefly, Penny, but and then we can TPP move on. was meant to be open architecture, the point being others could join if yep. you agreed to the standard, including China including other countries within Asia, including mm. other countries around the world. Mm. So I think that that promise is still highly relevant over time. Please get your questions ready, raise your hand. Mr. Jean, what um, will the Belt and Road Initiative, what will be the impact on global trade? I think uh, one Belt, one road is it's going to um, it's going to be a big mechanism for the global uh, trade because uh, one belt one row is to enhance uh, communicational uh, trade and uh, finance and also uh, we want to um, co-communicate co-construction uh, so this is a direction and this um, this is a direction that we are heading for because th this is a global um, world. And then, um, and then, and uh, one belt, one road is uh, focusing on developing countries. And but this is something we want to pay attention to, no matter uh, in what field, uh, agriculture, construction, or anywhere. Uh, they um, they need our support and help. That's why it can promote trade or uh, economy for the whole uh, globe. So we can provide. Uh, so we can uh, provide uh, opportunities to liberalize trade, and um, we can see that uh, we can see that many partners of our trade, of our trade, that uh, you can see that they're growing. And um, past uh, ten months, uh, we saw that in the um, we can see that we our trade partners increase by 
uh, by, uh, by, by 10 percent. And in trade or in investment, we, uh, we invest in, in one belt, one row countries. We, uh, we, uh, we increase uh, 5 percent. So this is actually a mutual thing. And so we are investing and we are trading with these countries, and they are investing and they are tr trading with, our, with us as well. So this is a, a free trade concept uh, that uh, we are promoting. And also, One Belt, One Row is uh, communicating people. We're connecting people. And, and this is uh, uh, exchanging of people, um, education, science and technology, science, sci life science, uh, traveling. Uh, when we communicate or we, when we cooperate together, this is going to serve uh, trade. And I think uh, indirectly it's going to have, um, we can learn from each other from different cultures and different economy. And so then it's going to be an open uh, trade and it's going to promote cooperation. Ready? Okay. Penny, your thoughts on Belt and Road Initiative? Well, I think it's a huge vision. You know, if you think about uh, trying to knit together Asia and Africa and the Middle East uh, and Europe through infrastructure is a huge vision. Asia needs trillions of dollars of infrastructure investment every year. So this, that's a good thing. I think the things to keep in mind are the concerns that one would have is to make sure that the standards for that infrastructure inve investment are kept high enough so that it protects the people. You're not doing damage to the locals, uh, you know, the, or the local environment, the local labor. You, you improve the local labor environment. And the second is to make sure that these are financially viable deals so that you're not leaving a countries, because many of these are developing countries, uh, that have, don't have a, uh, huge resources, you're not leaving those countries where they can't afford to pay back the loans that are being provided for the infrastructure. So, and that's in the best interest of all the parties involved. In other words, to have good underwriting and make sure that they live up to uh, global standards. 20 seconds on Belt and Road Initiative. I agree with the two speakers. Uh, very, very powerful initiative. Um, it, it will pour, it will bridge a, a, a huge infrastructure gap, and it's a Marshall Plan all over again, except bigger, much bigger, and the sovereignty of countries are respected. So it's got a lot going for it. It'll be a wonderful phenomenon, and I think everyone should, um, should explore the opportunities that exist for all countries in this Belt and Road. Penny, Andrew, and Mr. John, thank you so much for your terrific insights. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.